um, when I was a young writer and author, which really started right after college, I wrote uh, We're Number One in 1992 when I was 23, came out when I was 24. I lived about three blocks away from here and I worked two blocks away from here at The Nation. And coming over to The Strand was like coming to the temple of books and everything that was great in um, literary culture. So it's an incredible pleasure to be here again and to be here with my friend Ilana Horwich. So full disclosure, yeah, let's give it up for Ilana. This is not gonna be your typical book talk. Like, I'm gonna start out by just saying how biased I am. I love this woman, she's awesome. So she's my friend uh, as of a few years ago. She's an amazing writer, chef, humorist, as we'll talk about. Um, she's been a co-investor of mine. And we're both middle children. <laughs> so we have like a lot of neuroses to work out about that. So let's get at it, OK? Is this so, on? Is this on? Yeah. OK, perfect. And most of the people here know and love you already. So this is really going to be fun because I'm going to get you guys all into the conversation pretty soon. So, Milena Spiel, I think I said that right. You did, you did. Um, it's a cookbook, it's a memoir, but maybe it's really a self-help book. Um, <laughs> because, you know, you, you, you talk about life lessons through food, and for example, you say, I, wanna, I want you to experience the kitchen as a playroom and cooking as a game, where the goal is not to win, but rather to have fun, to express yourself and be daring and forgiving. And to me, that's like philosophy or something like that. So how does this work? How do you write a book that's at once a cookbook, a memoir, and probably one of the best self-help books I've read? Well, that is a very, thank you. That is one of the best self-help books that you read. You know, I think I just take life from a sort of philosophical slash spiritual slash way to grow approach. That's the way that I approach life. And cooking is, a, offers us all of those opportunities. And it's a way that I've been actually good at being daring and forgiving. There might be other parts of my life that I have a little bit more trouble or resistance being as daring or forgiving, but this is where I have been able to really get into that flow. And so I would say that I'm very cognizant of my own learning process whenever I do something, so I think that's how it turned into a self-help book, because as I taught myself to cook, I was aware of these different steps of that, you know, where I was growing little by little, what was happening inside of me that I was then able to share with others and I guess turn it into a self-help book. Who are you being, are you forgiving others or being forgiving of yourself? You would be forgiving of yourself in the kitchen. So, um, you know, one of the main things that deters people from cooking is that they are scared that they're going to mess up. So one of the main things that I'm addressing in this book is the fear that people have around cooking. So, yeah. Yeah, it is totally possible that you could burn something. I mean, I've burnt stuff in the middle of my cooking classes and like you just have to be forgiving. It's, I think, easy to be forgiving around like burning a chicken because it's just one chicken, it's just one night or you only spent an hour making it and like you might be able to eat it anyway, but I might have more difficult time being forgiving about some other aspect of my life. But, you know, cooking is reflective of, of, of anything that we are doing in life. All right, so then let's go back to the origin here, right? Because oh, the other thing I mentioned, we didn't mention, we're both Brunonians, for those of you in the know. <laughs> Went to Brown University. So you were at Brown University in your sophomore year. Um, you did something adventurous, which you can tell people because it's your prerogative. And that launched you on this journey. I think Andrew's referring to the fact that I took a um, psychedelic mushroom trip when I was at my sophomore year at Brown. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. Yes, um, it took me 20 years to, to, to try mushrooms again, but um, I had, I, it was spring weekend and I was told that if the first, you know, if the first time you ever took mushrooms, it was guaranteed to be a good trip. So I was like, okay, I will just do it one time. Um, and I had this incredible day, this incredible experience, which 
there's a couple people that were actually <laughs> at Brown with me at that time that are in the audience here. But I, I had, I was hanging out talking to a friend and a Frisbee was thrown by these guys way far away from me and it came speeding right past me. And while I was mid conversation, I just looked over with my left hand, caught a Frisbee and I was like, Oh my God, I just caught a Frisbee. <laughs> like, I could not believe what had just happened. Um, so later on in the day, I mean, I knew something, whatever was happening to me, whatever perception. You'd gotten was superpowers. Having, I had superpowers that worked. I actually caught the Frisbee. I didn't, you know, um, I had a, I had an epiphany that I was supposed to go off into the world and write about life and love. And it would like happen later on in the day. And I, that Frisbee gave me the confidence to believe in that epiphany. And I ended up, I waited a week cause I was like, I'm on drugs. Like, let me just like make sure that that's really what I want to do. And then a week later I went to the, you know, Dean at Brown and I said, I'm not going to be coming back next year. And you know what they said? That's perfect. That's what we want you to do. We want you to take time off. We want you to have life experience before you study. And that's, we support you. And I didn't have to give any explanation. And and then tell what us happened? about your adventures in Italy. What happened that led? So I ended up to going. I ended spiel. up calling. Yeah, I ended up letting my parents know that it wasn't coming back. And the next day, my mother had a chance encounter with someone that was looking for an uh, English-speaking student to come teach English in their homes. So I ended up decide going to Italy. Yeah. So what are my adventures in Italy? Well, my gosh, where do I even begin? I went to Rome. I mean, I didn't even know where Rome was on the map. I had to look at Italy and find where Rome was on the map. And I had actually been studying Italian with zero intention of ever going to Italy. So this is like how much I think that like if there is a God or there is a force in the universe, like that force wanted me to be in Italy. Um, what happened is well, where, do, where, where do you want me to start, Andrew? This is, I, I, I ended up getting dropped off in a Tuscan villa. Is that what yeah. we wanted to know? Is that what and you And you met know? your Italian mama? Yeah, so I went to go live with this family. I absolutely could not stand them. And within a week, I decided that I was going to leave. And I happened to get a letter from a, a girlfriend whose family happened to have a villa in Tuscany. And I literally went to the pay phone and like made a phone call to her. And she was like, yes, you can go to my family's house. So I end up in this gorgeous, gorgeous villa in Tuscany. I mean, I had never been to Italy. I hadn't spent much time in Europe. I had traveled some, but, um, and I was alone in this cold stone house. It was absolutely gorgeous. And it was, there were an old couple there, caretakers, Maria and Roberto. And Maria ends up, she is the mentor and she has written all over this book. And she's the woman that inspired me to cook with love and to cook intuitively and to, she raised the bar of the palate, of my palate, you know. So, and the inspirational thing is you grew up, as you write in the book, not cooking yourself and not really coming from a household that cooked. You made frozen pizzas, you said. Yep. Um, so, how did you, how did you, you know, approach this initially? And, and, and you, you describe your approach to cooking as intuitive, right? Meaning you're, you're not necessarily a believer in having people follow the recipe, right? So, well, so how did you get that intuitive feel? Okay. I am a believer in people following a recipe until they are able to be liberated to, and make really high quality food. I don't believe that intuitive cooking, I don't want you to just like, it's not like, a, I don't I don't know what Jackson Pollock's exact philosophy was, but let's just, I don't want you to just throw on this color and throw on that color and this ingredient and that ingredient. There is a structure to cooking. There is a way of creating excellent flavors together. There is a way of teaching people how to create that base of flavor. But ultimately, I want people to not have to be liberated, to be liberated, excuse me, to be liberated from the recipes themselves. So to tell the story about the carrots and Maria. So uh, well, I had, a, I, w even in my early 20s, I had this dream that I was going to write a cookbook and that I was going to collect all these recipes from Italian women all over the peninsula. So the first person that I went to was Maria. And I said, Maria, I need your, your recipe for meat sauce. And I expected her to go into a drawer and take out a recipe for meat sauce. And she didn't. She says, oh, you just, you know, you just put some carrot and celery and onion together. And I was like, wait, hold on. Like how much onion? She's like, an onion. 
you know, and then like sell, you know, how big is the pot? It's, you know, not what I, what I, how much olive oil? You just put in the olive oil. I said, well, uh, car- she said carrots. I said, how many carrots? She says, one or two. I said, well, what, what is it going to be? One or two carrots? One or two. I said, but uh, Maria, I, I, I'm writing a book. Like, I need people to know if it's one or two carrots. I need to know. She says, so what is it going to be? One or two? She's like, one or two. And I literally at that moment decided that I couldn't write a cookbook. Uh, I, I wasn't going to get precision from her, and I wasn't going to get precision, and hence there, that, would, that, that dream literally went out the window like that. And I had given up the, the, this dream of writing a cookbook because I didn't understand how else that would, ever, that would be possible. So it did take me about 15 years or something after that to come back around. And when I understood that I was going to be writing a cookbook, it's like, you're like, wow, that dream I had in my 20s was real. You know, you think, oh, it's a silly dream. I'm going to write a cookbook. Who was I to even think I could do that? And then your life sort of, my life led me in a way that ultimately had me start a cooking school and then I was writing a cookbook. So Nancy referred to this, but you, unlike, let's say, some people write cookbooks who are chefs primarily or whatever, culinary scholars, you're a teacher. I am a teacher. First and foremost. So why do you define yourself as a teacher first and foremost as opposed to a chef or an author or whatever? I started teaching uh, when I was still in school. So I spent my summers when I was in high school doing volunteer work in Latin America, teaching dental hygiene, teaching community sanitation. I was volunteering in schools uh, my summers in college. I mean, I was just always teaching. My first job out of college was working in inner city school, teaching uh, middle school. Then I worked in teaching high school, history, English. I mean, I taught all kinds of subjects. So... I've spent my life as a teacher. Then, when, you know, about 10 years ago, somebody offered to pay me to teach them to cook. And it's like, yeah, I had some experience cooking, but what I really had was a lot of experience teaching. So, what little I knew then about cooking, I could r- teach. You know, and the, the high school that I taught in in Los Angeles, which is called New Roads High School, has kids from all different kinds of Uh, cerebral backgrounds. I mean, there's kids with learning disabilities. I had kids with high-functioning, high-functioning autistic kids, Um, artists, not artists. Kids are really bright. Kids are just not that bright. Um, You know, like all different wealthy kids, kids that are, uh, were on total scholarship on a bus for an hour a day to get there. So, you know, I couldn't just perform like one thing that was going to, well, I had to find actually what was going to be that through line that I could reach everybody. And the through line really is igniting people's passion. If you can ignite someone's passion, then they can continue to learn on their own. But you have to appeal to a, that, yeah. To so that how does that happen with food? With cooking. Yeah. How do I appeal to, how do I ignite do you people? ignite people's passion to well, cook? Well, so this is a good question. First of all, a lot of people have a passion to cook. So let's put them on the side. I love working with people and finding the people that have a lot of fear around cooking. That's like my bread and butter. When people come to cooking classes and they're scared or they're like, they don't know, they're scared to buy a book or they're scared to have a cooking, those are the people that I do this for. Um, the main way that I could ignite a passion is really by helping them let go of their fear. And then I try to entertain them. I make fun of myself a lot in this book. I talk about, you know, it took me a long time to find my career. I mean, I basically felt like a complete loser for at least a decade. So I, you know, by sort of breaking myself down and breaking their fear down, perhaps that's that's the entrance usually into the passion. And of course, talking about Italy and the sensuality of cooking and the possibility of flavors and the beauty. I mean, all of that, of course, hopefully ignites people's passion. And let's let's talk about the spiel side yes um because one of the great things uh about this and i think we never even talked about it but one of the reasons we're friends you have this like intense interest in things that are both jewish and italian right yes and (laughs) that's super cool um so because it's like you get double the passion and neuroses um (laughs) So the spiel and the reference. Double the passion and double the neuroses. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah You yeah. talk about, like, you can teach schlamazels. Yes. Uh, so what, what is the whole Jewish angle in this thing? 
Well, the Jewish angle is that I'm teaching people how to make Italian food through the eyes of a, of a Jewish girl who lived in Italy. I mean, that's it. I was raised in like a Jewish neighborhood and a Jewish house, and then I went to Italy. And I was raised with this very strong um, goal, you know, vision for, for productivity and achievement. And here I went to Italy where it was about like, experiencing your senses and la dolce vita and this all about the beauty and soaking that in. And it was like very different than how I was raised. And yet I was like, they are onto something here. Like this needs to be merged. But the way that I express myself, I think is just through humor. I mean, that's the Jewish humor. You know, I did stand up comedy. Like I, that's how I, I analyze things. I'm analytical. I'm, 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 I make jokes, and that's my way of expressing. So. You also say in the book that this should be read in bed, I do say not that. in the kitchen. Why? Because if you're going to become an intuitive cook, okay, you can't walk into the kitchen with like a list of ingredients and a list of things that you need to do because then all you're doing is like, I have to chop tomatoes. Now I'm chopping tomatoes. Now I have to put the tomatoes in the pan. Now I have to put the tomatoes in the pan. Now I have to add olive oil. Now I have to add olive oil. And you're, and you're doing, you're, you're in your head. And that is not the way that I want you to cook. I want you to cook in your body. You know, if you're an actor, if you're not an actor, pretend you're an actor and pretend you're like, a, you know, Sophia Loren going into the kitchen. Really, actually pretend that. How would she do that? You know, she would just chop the tomatoes and put them in the pan and then put in the olive oil. <laughs> but like, if you, ha if you had read that in bed, you would have an understanding of how things are going to unfold without the pressure of having to do anything. And also what I want is to, you know, I use some subliminal hypnotic messaging in there that it will arrive to you when you're in bed lying down and least expecting it. And that's where the, uh, the inspiration may come to cook. You say that your uh, sauces, or one sauce at, at least you, you described, the, the tomato sauce, tastes like pure unabashed love. Yes. What does that mean? What does pure unabashed love taste like? Well, I mean, you... <laughs> <laughs> You've got a lot of you connection. Have to go to you have to you go got to a, a lot of connection between like the visceral yes. nature of making food and eating food and the love of food and sharing love. You talk about you can demonstrate your love for someone by cooking for mm -hmm. them. So the well, pure unabashed love, what does that feel like? Okay. Well, it's not in your thoughts. So it's, it's, it's in your body and, it, and it's in your heart. And when you eat food that is made with pure unabashed love, what happens is that you do this. Uh, you do, you know, you take a breath. You're like, oh, this is so, you, 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 it's, you, 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 something melts inside of you. And that's what the experience that I want people to have because yeah, okay, we can make good food for each other, but if we're making food with pure unabashed love, then we're actually changing lives. You know, we're actually like one bite at a time. And that's the point for cooking is that we, you know, it's, it is a primal thing. It's primal to cook and to eat. And we do need to make this world a better place. We always have. This is my personal form of tikkun olam. And, um, and so today is Giving Tuesday. So it's you're so, giving back. So giving back, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do a kind of quick hit list, and then we're going to go to questions of funny things in the book. Tell us about chicken crack, the Jews of Sicily, and the basics of balls. <laughs> That's like right one, there. one recipe. Okay. Chicken crack is my Jewish Italian, uh, Sicilian, my Jewish Sicilian chicken meatballs. There were Jews in Sicily before the Spanish Inquisition. So the Spanish Inquisition, right, Jews had to leave Spain. Well, they also had to leave all of the colonies of Spain, and that was Sicily. There were one to 200,000 Jews in Sicily before the Spanish Inquisition. The Jews were merchants, they, and they, they traded with the Arabs, so they got the idea of bringing raisins into their savory food. Then they were putting the, the delicious, amazing capers that are already found in Sicily and combining them. So when you have raisins and capers together inside of a food, you know that that's emblematic of the Jewish culture in Italy, particularly of the South. Having it made of chicken makes it even more Jewish. And what is the basic of balls? The basics of balls is my, I have to explain to you how and why recipes work so that you can be liberated. If you're making meatballs, you want them juicy. Right? You need your balls, gotta be juicy. So I say you, what you need is a lot of grated onion in there that keeps them juicy. And I also don't put in 
flour or breadcrumbs because one, it's fattening, two, it fills you up in an unnecessary way, and the downside is, is that your balls will not be perfectly round, but that doesn't matter if they're delicious. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take that to heart. What did brisket do for you that therapy, Zoloft, and energy healers could not? It, um, I, yes, I joke that I was looking, I was trying to get out of a state of depression, quite a long one, because I, I really took me a long time to find my career, and that was really excruciating for me, for someone who just really has passion, really wants to have purpose in the world. And uh, you're a middle child. And I'm a middle child. Um, so in that, I, when I first, yeah, I started cooking. I mean, I just decided, I gave myself permission to actually do nothing for a while. And in that nothingness, I was cooking. And brisket gave me this place to put myself, you know? And it takes a long time to make brisket. So I was able to put my passion, put my, use my hands, put my love, put my, my love of flavors. Um, and uh, yeah, something that Zoloft was never really able to do for me. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to your question in a second, but I need to know about salad dressing because this is really something I learned because uh, I'm in a household of foodies, but salad dressing should not be made separately. It, the ingredients should just be put on the salad and then tossed. That's Why? A, yeah, that's, Ital that's the way the Italians dress salad. Okay, so if you were, my next cookbook may have some salad dressings that go on there if we're talking about California Chinese chicken salads and stuff like that. But if we're talking about an Italian salad, they are only dressed in two ways, with salt, olive oil, and lemon, or salt, olive oil, and vinegar. Those are the two ways to dress a salad. And it goes directly into the leaves. And you just do it right at the table. And that is just the way that it's done. And that's exactly what Marcella Hazan says as well. So that is it. Yeah. All right. I'm opening it up to questions. What? It keeps it, it keeps it fresh and it keeps it crispy. And the reality is, is that you can't taste it. Sorry. Let me let me add yeah. one more thing. That if you are putting it in like a bottle and you're shaking it up, right, and then you taste it, well, you can't really taste it because you've got the olive oil on top. It's all been separated. You don't know what it's going to taste like. Then how much are you supposed to put on the salad stuff? You go little by little. You toss and taste, toss and taste. Needs more salt, you add more salt. Needs more acid, you add more acid. And and that's this, that's the visceral process that we're talking about. That that you are connected to the food. This idea that everything has to be measured and poured on and into perfection is a disconnect. You need to be connected to the food, and the salad is a great way to do that. I'm opening up to the floor. Any questions? Yes, sir. So you mentioned uh, adding a lot of onions to your meatballs, but if you're writing for a Jewish audience, you know there's a lot of things we can't digest. And like so onions. So some of like onions and garlic. Yeah. Um, so what do you do? What do you do? Okay, so first of all, I... In the book, you will be somebody here tonight already noticed it and mentioned it. There is a lot of talk of digestion. Um, you'd be surprised, but the Italians love to talk about digestion. And they have all kinds of culinary statutes that are all about digestion. Like you don't drink coffee and milk together after a meal because it creates gas. Okay? They will, you don't have coffee and orange juice and cappuccino together because it creates gas. You don't eat this together and this together because it's gas. You don't have ice water because it's gas. So they are obsessed with gas. Okay? <laughs> Um, so in that note, we are not putting big pieces of onion in our meatballs. We're grating them almost really, really fine, which makes a difference. So one might not be able to digest big pieces of onion, but actually grated onion might be okay because you're doing a lot of the digestion for yourself by like manually cutting it up. That's what your teeth do, the first part of digestion. So if you're making meatballs and you absolutely can eat no onions... I'm not sure you can make meatballs. <laughs> like, like that's really a tough one. Then you're gonna choose other recipes because meatballs are essential. Garlic, on the other hand, Italians don't eat as much garlic as you think. They, it's really about flavoring the olive oil with garlic and then getting rid of the garlic. So it's not about chopping garlic. So garlic you'll have a better chance with. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, sir. So this is more about learning than teaching, but you spend a lot of time in people's kitchens, yeah. their homes, like the center of your house. What did you learn from them? That is a great, great question. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the fundamental thing to being a teacher is that you are a student. So first, I mean, I say first and foremost, I'm a teacher, but actually first and foremost is I am a student. And having taught in classrooms for so long, I learned so much. You know, this entire cookbook is thank you to my students. Um, they are the ones that taught me what people, excuse me, need to learn to cook. They're the ones that taught me what approach is needed to teach cooking. They're the ones with all of their questions. I mean, I put 60 of their questions in the book and answer them directly, you know, which I call uh, the classroom corners, you know, how to brown chicken without sticking to the pan. What is parchment paper for? What the fuck is my broiler? Like all of these things. So they actually are the biggest guides in this book. Had I sat down to write this book before teaching cooking, I, I, I would not have had such a successful book, I don't think. Yeah, it's it's it, it's an emanation of that. Yes, Nancy. I was just wondering, in, in this modern world of technology and how people are just, um, you know, even the food, um, the food packages that were come that were brought to people's homes, they they, um, it doesn't seem like people are cooking that much. Is there is there a backlash? Is there a revival gon that's going to go on? Well, I mean, I mean, I, 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 that's what I'm doing. What I'm doing for. I mean, I'm doing it for that revival. I think that we're you know, there's two major things that happen when we don't cook. First of all, you cannot control the quality of the ingredients that you're eating unless you know what's going in it. Okay, that's, look, I'm going to say three things. One, that's one. So you cannot eat healthy food unless you are making it yourself. Very hard. Two, you can't control the energy that's going into your food unless you're making it yourself. So um, the doctor that actually prescribed me Zoloft at one time, since we've already brought that up now and it's out in the open, she told me that she doesn't like to go um, to, to, to restaurants because she doesn't like, she, can't st she knows how much anxiety is in restaurant kitchens. And she doesn't want to in ingest that anxiety. And then three, we're missing the human connection. I can take you to a restaurant and I can pay for your meal and that's beautiful. I love doing that. But that is not the same that connection that we are going to have if I cook for you. And what we need for peace on earth, number one, is to be connected to each other as human beings. To be able to look at each other in the eyes and, 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 and recognize the humanity in each person. That's really the fundamental thing that we need. And breaking bread is, there's no better way to do it Making than breaking bread. Breaking bread and making bread. Making bread and breaking bread. Yes. We should be getting world leaders together yeah. in kitchens and cooking together. I mean, And yeah. that could solve our problem. Yeah, it could solve, it could solve a lot of our problems. <laughs> That's awesome. Other questions? Yes. Hi, it's two parts, sorry. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> um, I like it. You mentioned mushrooms, right? Yes. And so you had an epiphany and I'm curious of how long that took from your epiphany to the pr production of your my book creation your yeah. book and you also mentioned doing them again uh. and I'm curious if you had any other epiphanies in that experience okay this is good questions <laughs> um, the my mushroom trip in college happened at 20 years old and so it took over 20 years for me to get this cookbook um, if I were to give advice to someone that has an epiphany or is starting down a dream or going, you know, following a dream, it, I, was, I was certain that I would finish a book and I'd come back with a magna opus after one year. But that's not necessarily the way things happen. Doors had to open for me. And along the way, I doubted myself enormously but the reality is, is that mushroom trip, that, that, that voice that I heard that told me that I needed to write never left me. And I kept, I kept fighting. Um, I have had some other mushroom experiences and recently, and I'm tripping now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, and the epiphanies that, that I had are ones that maybe I'm not ready to totally completely share, but that there is this connection to spirit. You know, we are not alone inside of our brains. Like, and there is something that is connecting us. And um, 
and that human consciousness is certainly not the only consciousness and necessarily not the not the best consciousness but can i just intervene on what second <laughs> so how does this relate to the notion i'm fascinated by this idea that the energy that the person making the food brings to the food is then conveyed to the person who eats the food absolutely how does that happen I mean, I don't know the science behind it, but, um, you know, I think that there is scientific, like it's been shown that even when Buddhist monks are praying that there's like molecular change inside of like the chocolate that they're praying for. So, I mean, our thoughts are energy and our feelings are energy. And I, I don't know the science behind it. I just know that you can feel it. And everybody who has ever eaten a love filled meal can, can feel cool. it too. Okay, we had a question here and then a question there. Yeah, we'll get to you in a sec. So are you still in touch with Maria? And what is her take on all of this? Okay, so I am still in touch with Maria. She's no longer the caretaker of this villa. She is retired. Her two children have become very close friends of mine, and I go and stay with them when I am in Italy. Um, they actually, well, so, th I mean, are you kidding me? She could not be prouder. I mean, she couldn't be more proud. When I first got to this place, I actually asked her, Maria, please don't cook for me. I want to cook for myself. And she had a very hard time letting me because that was her job. And I was too embarrassed to have somebody cook for me. Um, I have had the opportunity, I haven't delivered the books yet to them, but I've had the opportunity to read that story about the one or two carrots, which is in here, and translate it on the spot from English to Italian for her. And they, the whole family was just dying of laughter. They, they just loved it. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, do we have another question here? Yeah. Or comment? Yeah. Oh, it wasn't um, a question, but there was a movie about that, ingesting the um, energy of food. Like Chocolat. Chocolat. Yeah. The movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah this is not movie? a, th this is, no. I didn't invent this concept. I mean, this yeah. is a, <laughs> this is. Nancy. How's with the, I'm going to butcher this woman's name, Salmon Nushrat, uh, the, the, uh, the salt, fat, acid. Has, it seems like you're ripe for a net Netflix um, program. Has it, have you ever had that? <laughs> um, I am working on that. I am writing a show currently. It's, I, I'm not writing, I should say it's, a, it's an unscripted show, so I'm not writing a script, but I'm writing a treatment for a show which would involve me collecting stories from women all over the world. Um, and their cooking and, and, and their stories, because that's how I got started, and that's really who inspires me. Yeah. Cool. Yes. Hi. So um, I do a lot of meal planning recently to sort of avoid food waste. Yeah. And so this book, I'm new to it because I just found you tonight. Okay. Um, but there's a like, I've flipped through, and I see like a lot for like dinner parties and stuff. Can you translate like love cooking for like one weekday meals that sit in your fridge and like can carry you through the week like can you like translate like th these recipes i guess into like or what are you if you have suggestions for how you can like use these recipes to like carry you through yeah so first of all a lot of these recipes because i use a lot of olive oil which is like fundamental for flavor and health they actually s most of these are going to stay good in your fridge and i like eat my own leftovers all the time cold i don't even heat them up and i don't even sometimes sit down uh, <laughs> just open up the fridge and eat them um but if you're looking for things that really are meant to stay is those are the slow cooked foods so I, I divide my mains up into, into like grilled in the oven, al forno, and then slow cooked. So slow, I t explain to you how to slow cook in general, and that's the stuff that's going to really last for you. Listen, I don't teach meal planning. Like I understand some people do, and I, I really respect it. But if I can light up a passion for you to cook and know how to use ingredients that are already in the house and that's what I teach you, then you might not have to plan. You can just be spontaneous in, in that creation. I hope that answers your question. A secret to the Mediterranean diets in general from, from, from that? Look, from I lost this? 30 pounds when I went to Italy. So um, not even trying. So I, I think that there's a big secret to the Mediterranean diet. You know, this is very funny. I remember when I first got to Italy and I was having one of my first meals with Maria and her daughter, 
I didn't eat the bread, okay, because I was 30 pounds overweight, and what business did I have eating bread? Now, I might have eaten bread in private by myself so no one would see it, but I was certainly not going to do it in front of other people. So they said they noticed, they, they understood why I wasn't eating the bread. I didn't even have to say anything. And they're like, no, 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 but you eat the bread. If you eat it with olive oil, it's not fattening. And because it just goes right through you. And I thought that was so funny. And it's, it, I thought it to be true. I happened to have lunch with a three Romans in Los Angeles just the other day. And I said, I mentioned that to them. And they're like, yeah, yeah, of course, that's true. <laughs> you know, olive oil with bread, the bread isn't fattening. So um, the olive oil, like, it's like, sh it's lubrication. It shoots it right on through. Um, they have lots of vegetables. They're not eating processed foods and they're not snacking. So it's not just the Mediterranean diet, it's the whole Mediterranean way of living, way of eating, yeah. Um, one of the really cool things about the book is just how gorgeous it is. So we should, you should open this up and talk about, you self-published this book and then Ingram, one of the biggest distributors, picked it up. So you got to be in control of the creative. I did. And you had a lot of partners. So I want to give you a chance to talk about that. Thank you. Yeah. So that was, um, you know, there's, there's benefits and not benefits of self-publishing a book. But the, the, the hugest benefit and why I am so glad that my first book got to be, that I got to self-publish it is that I got to make all of the creative decisions for it, including this cover. So... The cover, it was as a teacher, it was very important for me to have a visceral, I wanted people to immediately have a visceral connection to the book, okay? This is not about your brain and your eyes, you're cooking from your heart. So that's that, I wanted it to also look like a Bible, and I wanted it to look like an old manuscript, we're in a rare bookstore right now, um, but I wanted it to look like an old manuscript that had been buried in a you know, monastery for a thousand years, hidden by the church because it had secrets that were gonna enlighten your life, and here you open it up and out comes dust and spells. So that's the, that's the feeling that I wanted to give, and I did jeans because Every badass, this is how to be a badass in the kitchen, knows how to rock a pair of jeans. So that's why we decided to do it in denim. You know, but I also got to choose like my editor, the creative editor of this book, not the recipe editor, but the creative editor of this book is a Jewish comedy writer in Hollywood. I mean, Seth Grossman. I, you know, he, I needed a funny Jew to, to edit my spiels. You know, I needed someone to be able to cut out the fat and like make my jokes land. Um, I chose for, I mean, the, for the photography, I chose a, photo look, here's a, here's a page right here, you can open it up. I chose um, a photographer that's not a food photographer, but he has a very sensitive eye to photographing gorgeous models. And he used to be a high school special education teacher, not that I was a special ed teacher, but he was a teacher. And I know teachers can tell non Ver non-verbal stories, you know? And then for food styling, I didn't want a food stylist. Like, I think they, they make food sometimes look a little fake and too shiny, and I wanted this not to be too perfect. I want someone who's scared of cooking to say, I can make that. So I brought in a fashion stylist, believe it or not, who I know, and who was young and undiscovered and totally brilliant, and, you know, she could pair this, like, sort of linen black napkin exactly with this and tell me to go get my nails painted white and just um, she knows my style of being rustic and she elevated the chic you know so well that's a beautiful thing yes one more question here oh, the photography in there is beautiful thank you um, and I'm just curious were you able to nail each of the meals on the first try uh, for in the, the photographs? In the photographs, yeah. We had to. I mean, that was it. I was like, I, I, I paid a sum that was like by the hour. So it was like, we had to nail them. Um, the one photograph, yeah, we got them. We, we, we got into a groove and we knew exactly what we were doing. We would plan before the photographs what napkin and what plate. So we weren't deciding it right then and there. We would go over it on the phone with a stylist. This is what it's gonna be made like, this is what it's gonna look like. Here's some photos of me doing it, you know, ugly photos that I have, but this is more or less what it's gonna look like. What plate do we wanna put it on? What sec, where in the book is it gonna go? We don't want it next to the same napkin of the one beforehand. So we sort of mapped it all out ahead of time. We did it, the, the rack of lamb. Um, I will say this directly to the camera. I make one of the best rack of lambs ever, and I break it down for dummies. It is extraordinary, but it's slightly overcooked in this photo, so it does not look as good as it should be, and I just, that was it. I had to, we had to go with it. So the answer is yes, but we did mess up kind of one, and it's still in the book. Thank <laughs> you. Right, but you extol the virtue of mistakes. You say it's like dance, right? 
I say there is a there is a life lesson through food, which is called shift into dance, which is there's the people that know that that are we go to a party. We're, all, we're we are these people. We go to a party. The music changes. We don't know the song and we're like, what is this? And then we're like, oh yeah, I got the groove. I can, I can groove to this. And then, you know, there's people that are like, I don't know what this song is and I have to go sit down. <laughs> that is not the attitude to take into the kitchen. You got to be able to shift into dance. And so, yeah, we make mistakes and you got to be able to shift. Well, that seems, oh, you have one yeah, more. Sorry, yes. the second question. I know in writing and editing things, there can be tough decisions to make. Uh, if I remember correctly, there were 110 recipes yes. in there. Was there a 111th that broke your heart to cut it out? Or is there a new thing you would have added at this point? I didn't have to... I didn't have to cut anything out. Um, I, I decided at first I thought I was going to be making a cookbook that was like of my cooking school. and But I had like nearly 300 recipes. So I had to understand that this the path of this one was going to be Italian food with healthy California influences. So it's a Jewish California girl's journey through Italy. And then I just understood what my next books were going to be. Do we say what they yeah. are? The next, the working title of the next book is My California Healthy Eating, and it's called A Jewish Girl's Guide to Not Getting Fat and Never Having to Diet. Um, and since I already told you that I used to be 30 pounds overweight, you can believe me that, that uh, I, went, I, I moved through that journey. And then there's going to be one about my, I don't know what the working title is yet, but it's healthy versions of ethnic foods. So I do Persian food and Thai food and Indian food and Mexican food with all California elements. Um, there were, some, there were some recipes. All of these recipes got tested by 100 people all over the country. Every recipe was tested by at least three people. And there were a few recipes that came back that everybody just didn't have a good experience with that were shocking to me because they had worked well for me in class and stuff. But clearly, there was mistakes in the recipe. And I was like, you know what? We're letting this go. Like, just we got to let them go. Uh, so my, OK. This is a great one that happened. Is that they're in your, you're in the Christine chapter right now? There's the Jewish Italian tuna toast. They are fantastic, but they were going to be a Jewish Italian spinach and raisin and pine nut toast, and they just didn't get good reviews. And so I went and scoured the internet looking for a Christino that didn't have butter. I didn't have butter. Excuse me. Didn't have cheese in it and you know, because the other ones had cheese, and could I find something that was Jewish-Italian, and I came across a recipe like that that was from Padova up in the north of Italy that was made with tuna and butter and whipped together with capers and olives. It is, unfortunately, I didn't get a picture of it, and so people don't make it as often, but it is just delicious. We should break for some of those. Yeah, I know. I'm sorry I didn't cook for you all tonight. Thank you, everybody. Um, yeah. Terrific discussion. Oh, yes. The totes, the kitchen badass totes, are for you to keep. Um, please wear them all over New York City with yeah. all your designer clothing. Let's thank give you, a hand Andrew. to Ilana. <laughs> thank you, Ilana. <laughs> Ilana, thank you for being a badass at the Strand Bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> and you're going to stick around and sign your yeah, copies. Thanks. Sign. And it's the holiday. We need gifts, yeah, right? And we're going up for uh, anyone's here. We're, we're going to have cocktails around the corner. <laughs>